Hello and welcome to The Double Life. I'm John Boostar, and this week we visit New York City and sit down with writer, journalist, and documentarian Thomas Morton. We discuss early days growing up in suburban Atlanta, going to school at NYU, interning and eventually working for Vice Magazine, and everything he has learned along the way. Enjoy. It's always it's 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 one of those funny things that like kind of never goes away. I used to be really, and especially like because I guess my my job became interviewing people sure. pretty early on, and that was something I hated doing. When um, like when I was in college, I took a reporting class that involved like go out, you know, like a real basic assignment every week, which was like you'd get like a topic or something mm. like that. And it was like, go interview three people like somewhere, you know, from your neighborhood, from wherever, whoever you think's good, like, just, you know, boot leather reporting, just like go ask them about what they think about, you know, what's happening in politics, whatever the topic was. Mm. And I would, I would make up, I would make them up. So I'll just to avoid having to like go actually ask somebody, wow, like I would yeah. just totally invent, invent people, invent responses. Yeah. Um, Did he do it and first I, and then go like, Oh wow, this is not, Cool. Yeah, I tried one person and it was just like, it was totally, it was totally a fine interview, but, um, you know, for like a, a three question, just man on the street kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I, I, I was never sure if the, uh, um, if the teacher was like wise to it. Cause one time she was like, she was like, man, you get really good answers out of people. That's impressive. And I was just like, I was like, is that like, <laughs> it's like, cause I'm just literally, I'm just writing, yeah. <laughs> writing these answers, creating, creating personages, like saying what I, I would hope they would say. And what I realized from that first interview with people. And then later on, when I actually did start, you know, stop tending to interview people and did it, um, that in general, you know, you, sometimes you get somebody who has a really, you know, really puts together a sentence nice there has a really thoughtful way of expressing something mm. nine times out of 10 they don't. And there's like, I've come to appreciate the poetry of people's weird kind of like, you know, rough, rough speech patterns. Sure. Um, but, uh, but it it usually doesn't read, you know, doesn't Mm -hmm. read like subject or predicate. (laughs) Right. Yeah, no, totally. (laughs) Not an easy sentence to scan. It's a lot of, yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting that you, uh, so you weren't necessarily, I don't know. So you grew up in Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I did grow up in Georgia. Yeah. So you grew up there and, um, also, I mean, there's information about you, so don't feel like, yeah. I'm like oh, no worries. Google yeah, you or whatever. No- it's just basic stuff as far <laughs> as like, uh, you got no, like no, a no. English major, right? You weren't necessarily uh, into yeah, journalism or any of that. That's the whole deal. Yeah. Um, I went to, I grew up in suburban Atlanta and I got scholarships and stuff to NYU. So I went there. Wow. That's awesome. Um, for school, it was awesome. Yeah. I was very fortunate. Um, and, uh, and I, yeah, I did, I was a little on the fence about doing my big, I, I was an English student, but I, you know, I was, I was dabbling with minors, other, having other things to do. And, um, and so I did try, uh, I tried a little bit of like journalism school, essentially. That's that, that was the class where I was making up fucking sources, which is great, mm-hmm. great, great first step into, into journalism. Right. Right. Um, but that was reporting one, you know, it was the, it was the base class. But, yeah. um, and I remember with that, first of all, being like, I, you know, I hate having to go out and try to talk to people. I, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm good at it. Mm-hmm. It's very awkward for me. I'm very shy. Sure. You know, um, and then, but then also in the course of that class, kind of like, cause interviewing people was a major part of it, but so was writing and reporting stories. And, um, I mean, I, I think I remember specifically, well, there was like, there's a smattering of ethics in it. And I remember having this kind of moment where I was like, these, was like these ethics seem well intended, but they're definitely more in line, less in line with telling the right story and a good story and protecting like the honesty or whatever of the, um, of the writer or of their, you know, of Mm. their subjects or anything like that. And it's like, it seems a lot more in line with protecting the interests of the publisher 
um, not embarrassing the paper. Everything just seemed like it was, I don't know, it was this moment that, um, that I've, you know, I've kind of gone back to a number of times where I really wondered, I was like, are these, eth- like, who are these ethics for? Like, are they, you know, like one would hope that they would be so that you're, you know, to make you a good reporter, to make sure that, that, you know, the stories you're printing, the sure. stories you're writing and reporting are as truthful as you can make them represent, you know, the mm-hmm. best, the best effort to understand something. It just never seemed that way. It always seemed like, you know, there was always just weird little things. Um, and so I, I, I became a little like, uh, I'd say more than a little disillusioned with, with the craft of journalism also. And I guess the worst part of it was that they, um, they just promoted this really formulaic uh, method of writing, um, uh, which yeah. at first I was kind of like, well, is this sort of like, you know, when like there was a class, I remember, I think there's a class like this in every college that you're you know, supposed to go to your first year where you're like, you're like how to write an essay, just to make sure everybody is kind of like on board with how you write, you know, and it's, it's across majors, across disciplines and things like that. And so I kind of, I gave it, the benefit of the doubt in that, you know, it's like, Oh, these kids maybe have never, you know, written, tried to write something for, you know, a news, you know, a news, a school newspaper, whatever it would be. Mm. Um, but then like, it really became clear that it was, um, that it was, and it explained why like news, I had always wondered why newspapers are so fucking boring (laughs) and why they all read the same as if written by the same people. And I was like, Oh, I was like, here they are just, explicitly instructing me yeah. to write in that manner to see, see things in kind of almost like also as if there's an algorithm mm. in which, you know, with, with which to deliver information. Sure. And, yeah. and so, yeah. And so I was like, well, screw it. I'm an English major. Then. <laughs> I was like, I, 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 I prefer, yeah. I prefer that, that sort of writing to, um, I totally get to, that. Uh, I, uh, this journalist kind of, yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm creativity. Anything that's good about it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and all the enjoyment too. That was the thing. I was just sort of like, I just remember being miserable. I don't know if this is how you feel, but like, mm-hmm. I was just like, it turned writing into such a weird kind of chore. And I was like, this is the thing I like. <laughs> like, this is, you know, sure. What a, why, why, why pursue this if, um, if I'm just going to hammer out what, uh, you know, whatever little soul. Yeah. It's, but for uh, you, what was your like foundation of, I mean, what really got ooh. you into literature and what, what made you oh. want to go into English and writing and all that? Man, somebody asked me this last night and I was totally, I'm glad I had have the practice of admitting that I was, I was completely stumped. Um, I read a lot from not a young age. I think I was like, I wasn't one of those like crazy, like two year olds who can read. Mm. It was like regular, learn, learn to read at the regular pace. I'm a very slow reader too. Like there's nothing fantastic about that, but I did like, you know, kind of like read a lot, but like also wrote a lot. And like, it's, it's one of those weird things where I was just in just last night, I was trying to kind of like place myself in where, at what point I was, I, I you know, kind of like, started thinking of myself like I guess I thought of myself first as a you know somebody who people say writes well and was always you know just like pleased with that because I was tiny wasn't good at sports you know there wasn't there weren't there weren't many other accolades Mm. I have a whole desk drawer at my mom's house full of uh fifth place ribbons from um swim team wow uh growing Congrats, up which is yeah. like it's like why why even give why even give that like made an extra um, one do they have six place yeah. ones too i wonder how that guy felt i i feel like i feel like there was only there there couldn't have been more than <laughs> there must have been a sixth place right? right yeah if there was a sixth place i would have gotten the sixth place ribbon i'm pretty sure i'm mm. just not a very strong swimmer but in any case um uh i do remember and this is uh, so fuck it i'm just gonna be this is like a not this doesn't present me in a great light but i remember reading at some point other people's essays and i want to say i mean this happened twice that i remember one time i'm pretty sure was in high school I'm trying to place it in my mind and then the other time was in college um and it was seeing it is i mean this actually yeah, this is a real asshole kind of thing to say i saw other people's writing and i realized what kind of came what felt right and came naturally. And I'd always been a little dubious of, you know, when people are, would, you know, teachers would say nice things about that. I'd be like, well, I'm sure they're, you know, I was like, I'm glad they're saying these nice things and that feels good, but I'm sure they're saying this about everybody. Right. What a teacher does. Right. Mm-hmm. And I definitely like, I had this moment where I read other people's writing 
And I was like, oh, I was like, this is <laughs> it's like, this is terrible. Yeah. I was like, and if this, yeah. And it, so there was this by contrast um, that really cemented um, this idea that I was like, oh, well, this, if this is something I'm okay at, like this is something that comes to me a little more easy than it seems to others. And that just makes sense because I'd read like, and I remember, you know, I, I feel like one of my favorite jobs has always been editing other people's writing. And there's something, you know, some people, some people kind of have it, some don't mm. like we're in it. And I remember this too from, I don't know if you play music at all, but there is like, there's a kind of a linguistic aspect I've found in music sure. where yeah. I've never, like, I've never, you know, I can't read, read music. I've mm-hmm. never taken lessons, but I like to fool around with stuff with people. And there's, you, you know, you get into a groove with somebody or, you know, you, you know, you're playing something and somebody, somebody does something, you respond to it with a different note. And it's and it's like, and it's, and it's a language. It's straight up just like, it's a weird, you know, kind of unspoken grammar, hmm. you know, which I guess all grammars are, well, they're supposed to be unspoken. <laughs> but anyway, um, that you take part in. And so the literal grammar was, um, um, I don't know, just didn't like, it was, it was a thing. It was a thing that instead of struggling with, which I saw other people struggling with, but like I loved and just like came, came very naturally. Um, but, uh, in terms of what I should be saying when people, um, ask me those kind of questions. So this weird pretentious story about reading other people's essays and thinking they were terrible is, um, I'm trying to think the, I mean, like the, it, it, it's I, like, I, I'm always like aghast at myself because the two major books, Let's call it three. Or um, uh, they're they're books that are commonly assigned in school, which is what I hate um, because uh, because you know it's just like oh, a teacher made me read Catch Twenty Two, and I loved it. But hmm. what happened was I, I you know later on a teacher would make me read Catch Twenty Two, and I was like, this is great, this doesn't work. But those, those were it was Heather Kurt Vonnegut, um, oh. and then uh, Carson McCullers. Um, kind of thrown in there or, or you know what no it was the classic like before that even it was because Carson, McC- Carson McCullers I started reading because I was reading because somebody gave me a copy of Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Fool mm. and there was some and there's a southern connection of some sort I don't I don't know exactly how to draw the line from John Kennedy Tool to Carson McCullers except that they both lived in the south except that they both had this you know kind of air of loneliness to them um mm. but it was those really, you know, the like, like at least a month, you know, at least David Foster Wallace isn't in there, but it was the very classic sort of, you know, like precious late 20th or mid to late 20th century, like, you know, kind of canonical writing that, um, that, uh, I don't know, just really gel, like dovetailed with, you know, my own, like the way I saw, you know, the way I saw the world, the way I, the way I liked to write and to speak, and I'm sure, you know, led to me adopting very obvious stylistic, like, steals from them. Um, but um, but I, 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 I wish I had a better, um, <laughs> I wish I had a better story <laughs> uh, or a better moment. It was just like this long thing, yeah. And I wrote, and like I wrote for, we had a, a high school newspaper, as, as most high schools do, and mm. I was very fortunate to, um, and that was, may, maybe that's a better <laughs> place that, I, you know, 20 minutes later I should have started at, was that um, by a friends that got involved with our, our newspaper, and we had a very, a very cool teacher who was in charge of it, um, mm. who had some, uh, her, I believe her nephew was at Harvard, so a smart nephew, and he would send her copies of the Lampoon because like, I think he worked for them. Like he was on the staff, maybe, oh, cool. or just he nice. liked it. Mm-hmm. But regardless, her name was Miss Sanders, and she would have copies of the Lampoon, the Harvard Lampoon, like recent copies. This is you know 1999, 2000, lying around, and it was also right when you know I think the Onion had been around for like two or three years, at mm-hmm. least like at least to my awareness, and it was mostly it was online. I, didn't even realize they'd printed a physical copy of it. But those two things um, were kind of uh, what we would read in newspaper class. Or, you know, it was a class, basically. It wasn't a class. We were just making the newspaper, but it took up a class period. Um, and we turned, me and like 
some of my friends, we basically turned the newspaper into this like weird, you know, kind of farcical humor magazine mm-hmm. for a year or so until we got in trouble uh, <laughs> for doing for, for, I guess, blurring the lines of, uh, of, you know, comedy and, New, newspaper reporting sure. <laughs> too hard and um and they they which which coincided with the the beloved teacher miss sanders leaving for a different job and uh-huh. them putting another teacher in charge who was more focused on like making it a proper newspaper wow. we changed its name and they you know put the the serious kids in charge like you know they became the editors um so they were really then, upset about that. It was a weird little. It seems like they took serious in action. A teapot, yeah. Wow. Well, they yeah, it was like we really ruffled a little, ruffled some feathers. Um, I remember getting yeah, getting called to, and, and it was weird too because it wasn't just like I, I tried to figure out who whose feathers exactly I ruffled. Because I remember right. getting um, we we made this like this joke piece. It was a pictorial piece. And, and, and here's the thing too, we were like, we, we were asking for it. Like we would go, like, I'd use the press pass to like, we just screw around. Like we just go like wander, you know, you're not supposed to like just be allowed to walk around like the school grounds or whatever, like go out to the football field. Mm. Um, and we just do that and we'd be like, oh, we're doing, you know, newspaper, you know, doing something. Yeah. And we weren't, we were just screwing out, you know, screwing around, going to smoke cigarettes sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. go off to Wendy's, like get some food. Um, I think he used to order pizza to that class, like Jeff Spicoli and, um, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, yeah, totally. um, which, which they, they would serve through the window because wow. we weren't supposed to go outside, like to where the cars come. So yeah, there, there was a, it, it, we were definitely having a little too much fun for, you know, anybody, any, any onlookers, um, uh, kind of expectations of a, a proper high school newspaper. Um, but we ran this thing where it was this invented tournament called the extra special Olympics Hmm. that involved all this weird sports equipment we found somewhere. And we were all wearing, got these like, it's like a combination of bathrobes. And I think there was a judicial robe that we had found at like a thrift store and, Hmm. um, just these weird, you know, it's like oversized ball we found in some storage shed somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, basically just trespassing. Thing, misusing a lot of property for the school. Then we called it the Extra Special Olympics, which, um, like, once it went to print, we were like, uh, I mean, we got yelled at for, right, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, we don't, weren't making fun of the Special Olympics by any measure, but they were like, that's an insensitive thing to, to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, we were called to the, me and the editor were called to the office, his office. And on the way there, a, we had to pass it. We had this weird layout for the school where you'd have to walk through other classrooms sometimes to get to the hallway. Hmm. And so there was this teacher in between the newspaper room and the hallway. And so anytime any messages came through, it had to come through her class. And she had, what happened was the person came in and told us they're like, Hey, you have to go to the principal's office and said, there's like five or six parents of special Olympians who are oh, angry at wow. you. And we're like, oh crap. And it was like, hadn't, you know, joke title hadn't occurred to us. It was just like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> and we made our way to the principal's office and it was just the principal. And we're mm. like, where, where are these, where are these parents? And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, here's my problem. Blah, blah, blah. And he starts laying out. And what we figured out was the teacher whose room we passed through had caught the messenger on her way to and told her to tell us that. <laughs> wow, that's funny. Like just to just to make us sweat a little more. Yeah. Anyway, dang. Sorry, long story. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> but, uh, so that, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think it's was, interesting because it shows that. I mean, a couple of things that I mean digest with everything that you said. One, um, I don't think it comes out pretentious because you kind of went off the. You started by saying that you got like fifth place in you know, swimming and stuff like that. Swim team, yeah. And it seems like, you know, you used the writing as something that, you know, gave you purpose and meaning and it made you feel better about who you are as a person. So I don't think that comes off as pretentious. I think it is something that you highlighted your strengths at a young age, which is awesome. And then with the the newspaper thing, I think it's interesting because it shows that, you know, you definitely had a little bit of a rebellious spirit and you weren't super 
shy and like introverted. You still had those moments where you were able to be out there and outgoing and do these things that may be, you know, controversial or whatever. And you weren't afraid of getting in trouble because it was something that you genuinely loved and cared about. And it's something that you are passionate about. And I think that carries over to like all the work that I've seen of yours and that I'm a huge fan of is that, you know, a genuine sense of curiosity. And I think that carries over and everything. So, you know, just to digest everything that, you know. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And it was, and, and, and it's funny because I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't within, within a source, like with the, within my friend group, I certainly wasn't shy. I wasn't within school. I wasn't shy. And it was, um, I think the, the whole thing that kind of caught me about interviewing people was talking to a stranger, mm. you know, just approaching a stranger and talking to them. And, um, once, you know, I, I, I faked my way through it in a reporting class and and then I didn't take any more reporting classes. Um, but then when I, I interned at Vice Magazine and was, you know, assigned one day as an intern, be like, I think the very first interviews I did were just, um, it was uh, for a fashion spread. So I was interviewing the people who were, we didn't used to use like traditional models. It was usually like, if we were doing an education issue, then we, you know, the models would be people who are actual teachers and you know, mm. and something like that. And so I don't, I think they were like, actually, I think they were, they think it was a music, the music issue. And I think they were music teachers. But in any case, I had to do a phone interview with about five, a real basic thing, two or three questions with um, four or five strangers, whose numbers I had. Um, and I remember just like, I, I remember putting it off as like long as I could, because I was just like, it just made me anxious. I just didn't want to do it. Um, and, uh, and I continued for a while, um, until at some point it just kind of went away. I'm, I'm a big believer in that whole, what's it, is it 10,000 hours? If you do anything for 10,000 mm. hours, yeah, I believe so. You, you, yeah, you gain a measure of whatever facility or expertise or acumen sure. with it. And, um, and that was literally, yeah. Like talking to other people, talking to strangers specifically, yeah. talking, asking questions that, which I'm beyond grateful for. I think it's the being able to talk with people is an, an insanely undervalued gift, especially in like American culture. It always, it, it always, um, how to say this? I'm always a little bit either pleasantly surprised or like despairingly unsurprised when like in some random kind of like in like a grocery store or something around the country and just try to add, you know, just try to talk a little bit with the cat. Mm. The person at the cash register, just like very basic, like, how are you doing? What's going on around here? Like, you know, yeah. how about that last guy? What's, what's up with this shirt? You know? Uh-huh. And when you get those, those folks who just like, who immediately like seize up, like they don't know, like, just like if you, if you're not asking something on the script, it's like, you can process the terror on their face. They just don't, don't have, you know, have never been conditioned to be able to have regular conversation. Sure. Um, one thing I do want to touch on, which I'm, you know, Mm. curious about is what, what made you want to intern at Vice Magazine? I know back then it wasn't really, Vice started as a magazine for all the listeners that don't know, it was what, Suru Shalvey, Shane Smith, Gavin McGinnis, who started in, Mm -hmm. uh, 1994. 1994. Yeah. It was a, it was a 10 year old magazine when I went to interview there. I was like, I missed it. I missed the good, the good days there. It was my favorite magazine. What's it? Um, okay. I remember. And it was, it yeah. is pretty like, uh, I don't know, I guess my listeners are probably a younger demographic for the most part, but they probably know Vice as like, you know, HBO and the Massive video, and yeah. all that, you know, which um, is cool. Yeah. But back in the day, you know, I started following like magazines and I would buy these books of like the old issues and stuff. And it was definitely something that yeah. wasn't, uh, I don't know how to word this, like a was, super politically yeah. correct magazine. Oh, not so. at all. Yeah. And that was a very, like, it was very much a product of its times. Um, and it reads, it, it's weird because it has this reputation. First of all, it has a reputation as being like a frat house, which sucks because it was like, um, cause that always like makes it seem like a, like, and, and being a boys club, which when I started at it did not feel like that at all. It felt like a weird little like clubhouse. Mm. Um, that was, you know, that was, I mean, it was tiny. There was, there's very few of us, but there's certainly, there's certainly plenty of, plenty of women involved and who have been, you know, instrumental in it, but it was like what they do get right about that. I just like, you know, 
they, I have a knee jerk reaction to frat house, but at the same time, it was a crazy place. It was a, it was a bunch of people who were clearly, you know, clearly friends, if not just drinking buddies with each other who were all there, Mm -hmm. not making a lot of money because it wasn't a, it wasn't a cash cow. And we're there to do something that they wanted to do. And that was fun. And that, you know, kind of like barely felt like work at, at its best times, even though it did involve as any, you know, especially a print publication it does involve a lot of work. You know, we put a lot of, a lot of work into that, but, um, like you were saying, but you know, what's funny is like, I've gone back and I've had people who didn't read it like from like 2000. So when I was reading, it was like, I think probably the first issue I saw was 2001. And I interned there in 2004. And between those years, I read absolutely everything I could. Like they would, you know, post most of the issues online. I'd read articles multiple times. I only had my, got my hands on like a couple of it. It's really hard to find issues, it is, and, which yeah. I learned, Super learned the reason why when I did the distro for oh, uh, the magazine. And that's because we, would, we, you know, printed very few essentially, but you know, when, when they'd be dropped and they were, we never put them on newsstands. So when they'd get dropped off, they could drop off at like bars and uh, coffee shops and boutiques along this, like a route that was, um, you know, there were a few different cities or like five or six, I think in America where we did them. And the magazine is free too, right? Huh? It was a completely free magazine. Well, that was the whole deal. Yeah. And, and I was just, I was explaining this to somebody else too recently that, um, I learned from that, um, early on when, when I was interning there and I was curious about why they were so adamant about the free thing. And they were like, well, you know, all ads, you know, all magazines run on ad revenue Mm -hmm. and that like the, the whole cover pricing thing is they're like, like people don't like magazines don't make money off subscriber base or newsstand sales. It's like, that's, it's 99% ad revenue. And what they use those prices for is to establish like a, basically establish a level of prestige or a level of, um, how to say this, like socioeconomic status with their readers. And that Mm -hmm. in turn gets sold back to the advertisers as like, Oh, look at, you know, we sell, you know, we sell the New Yorker for eight bucks and that's, that's a different caliber of person than buys, you know, a $3 copy of us weekly or whatever. Um, and that gets, you know, put in front of people who would be more likely to advertise with the New Yorker than, um, us weekly on account of, they want to target those people, you know, a a more upper middle class and aspirational kind of like, you know, college educated market Mm -hmm. versus a mass market to put it, you know, to say it nastily, but to put it in decent terms. Um, and so this, you know, the whole thing with free, or at least, you know, as, as it was kind of back then was that it was like, screw the newsstand, screw the rules. It's like, we, we make our money the same way everybody else does by advertising. So it's like, we're not going to charge you additionally, like just to, you know, just to get a copy of this, mm. like, cause you're already, you know, one, it's already been subsidized. And two, the, you know, that whole, you know, the reader is part of that subsidy. Like that's the way advertising works. It's, you know, anyway, um, I like that they were free. Let me just say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it felt more honest than, no, than the agree. whole, the whole newsstand model, which I learned, which is you know, essentially a cartel. Yeah. yeah. Meets, meets the legal definition of a cartel. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Did you, uh, I guess the first initial, I don't know, like going into that, was it intimidating to speak to? I mean, Oh my God. Oh wait, to other people or to the people at Vice? Well, I I would imagine the people at Vice would be somewhat intimidating. Like Shane seems like a somewhat intimidating dude. Uh, Sarish seems like a nice guy. He wasn't around so much. Oh, okay. It's like, you you know who it was, who was in charge of the, it was, well, what was crazy was when I was reading the magazine, there were all these different writers in it. And I was amazed by how they all seemed to share a sense of humor. They all had very similar stylistic tics. And what I assumed was, I was like, I was like, hell, these like, there's like 10 main writers, 10, 15, maybe. Mm. I was like, they must all like, they must all hang out. Like this is, there's no way they all like sound exactly the same. They must be a close, close group of friends. Mm. And what it was, was there were two, two main editors, um, Gavin, and then Jesse Pearson, who, um, who was the editor in chief, like my direct mentor. And they all wrote under, they both wrote under about like, four or five assumed names each. So they'd write, you know, they wrote the majority of the magazine between themselves. Um, and then there were a few core contributors, like our music editor was uh, Amy Kellner, who um, who would write, I'm trying to remember some of her pseudonyms. Anytime you saw something by Meg Sneed, that was Amy Kellner. Obviously, anytime it was by Amy Kellner, it was by Amy Kellner. Hmm. 
Um, but there were a few others and it was this tiny little, um, tiny little stable of, of, um, core contributors. So it was like Gavin, Jesse, Amy Kellner, uh, Leslie Arfin, Chris Narako wrote under his own name, Leslie Arfin, I think almost always wrote under her own name. But for the most part, like half the, you know, more than half the people I'd read didn't exist. They were just, they were pseudonyms of these, you know, three to four, um, three to four folks, which explained Find, you know, yeah, very, very wow. quickly why they all felt, why, how they all had the same voice. So crazy. Um, <laughs> did you but, go under Thomas or did you create a pseudonym for yourself as well? I have a, I had a bunch. Wow. Um, so interesting. I think, mind blowing. And, <laughs> and it became, and it became weird because, um, it was, I would choose when we need to use my real name. Like there would be, it wouldn't just, it wasn't just an automatic thing. It wasn't like, it was like, Oh, I wrote this. And especially like, um, I took over, when, so when did I become web editor? 2007 or so. And we went to kind of like started trying to make the website less of a monthly thing. Like where we just, you know, put up the magazine, had like had a daily blog, do daily posts. And so there's a lot of, you know, the writing increased exponentially. And, um, and I would almost always write under an assumed name just because that was kind of what you did. You didn't seek credit for doing these things. It was a very kind of like, there was a, there's a workman mentality to it where it's just like, you just, you know, like you're just writing this to write it, not writing this for glory or accolades, especially at the blog. The blog was just very, you know, write whatever, write whatever you can feed the beast, you know, as it went along. And, um, I would only ever use my, like I put my real name as a byline. If there was like a reason for it, like if there was something like, if it, you know, played in, in a, it played a part in whatever I was writing. And, you know, if it was tied to a video that I was in and it was very clearly that's me. Um, or if I wanted to make a point with it or something, or I wanted to like, you know, like identify the fact that, you know, this was, this was me saying this. Um, but for the most part I wrote under, like I'm trying to remember, like Leroy Gumption was a name I used a lot. Uh, mm. I think it was like Terry Hand or something. And there were like regulars that were just like regular nicknames that were just, you know, BS pseudonyms I'd come up with, but there was, um, the music editor I mentioned, Amy Kellner, um, who we used to sit next to each other at the office and the music review section had about, I think there's about like five or six people usually writing them, maybe six or seven. And people would write like four or five reviews a piece because there would be, there were little capsule reviews. And so there'd be like 40 of them. And, we'd always use like fake names with those because otherwise you'd just see the same name mm. 10 times in a row and just look, it was, it was almost an aesthetic choice. It would look cruddy. Right. Um, and, uh, some people had their own fake names that they liked and some people were, you know, clever with stuff like that. Um, but others would just be like, you guys can come up with something, you guys do what you want. And so, um, like the, one of the last tasks whenever we'd be finishing an issue would be coming up with the, coming up with the pseudonyms for the music reviews. Um, and there was a name generator um, who I, I wish I could remember. It was a website where you could just click a button and it would produce all these insane, just odd. I, I don't know how it came up with these names, but there were some beautiful ones. I wish I could, and I wish I had them written down somewhere. It'd be like, be like Malfoy Carnumpkins. And you're like, oh, Malfoy's going in. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> Malfoy? Like, yeah. Um, That's so cool. But, uh, <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. I, I babble so much. Oh, no, you're moment. totally fine. No, uh, no, all of that is um, <laughs> totally in line. What's interesting about the name generator is, you know, uh, Childish Gambino, the rapper? Yeah. You know, he, I mean, I don't know him, but he's, he's an amazing rapper. Yeah. Yeah. He came I up with him. his name by just going into a uh, Wu-Tang <gasps> name generator and came up with Childish Gambino. Oh. He's like, oh, that sounds cool. And then he made, <laughs> like, that's how his name. And now he's like, whatever, oh. you know, award winning musician with yeah. a name that was created by a name generator. That's, that's amazing. Name generators. And it's like, it's, do those even, I don't know if those exist very much anymore. It's kind of like the, uh, do you remember soundboards being oh, a big yeah, thing yeah, on the yeah. internet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like one of these, I was talking with a young lady last night, we we're talking about search engines, like plural, you know, <laughs> like back when, but it wasn't just Google yeah. and there were, you know, you had to pick your search engine. It was always a, Hot fan, but bunch, name generators. Yeah. That's a, that was the, the that that was the thing. Or insult generators, I guess too. Oh, they sure. Were, they were yeah. part of it. Generators in right. general. Yeah, just there's a whole period. Have someone else do creative stuff for you. Kind of interesting. Uh -huh. 
Precisely. Uh, Not even someone else, like, code. Right, <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, Ask literally, yeah. So interesting. Um, <laughs> right. One question I did have for you. You were talking about... Mm. Um, like books that you're super into. And then like, Mm. uh, you mentioned class earlier, which is kind of cool, but you, um, had this segment where you went and on balls deep, you visited these people and they're, I guess it was in college, their freshman like orientation and Mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. And you were talking about how the book class by Paul Fussell was such a big influence on you. And, um, uh, so I, I purchased the book. I was like, Hey, you know, I I admire Thomas and I'm going to go read it. Uh, I got into you can get, it. You can get those real cheap too. Right? You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Super, super, not expensive at all. What I thought was interesting is that that book, you know, in this day and age, with everything happening in 2020, I think the relevance mm-hmm. of it still strikes through, even though it was written in like 1983 or whatever. Right. What I thought was interesting is one segment in the beginning of the book where he says, "For the bottom class, class is defined by money. In the middle right. class is defined by money, but also." the work that you do. And then the upper class believe that class is defined by your taste, your values, your ideas, your style and behavior, which money is a given. Exactly. Which I thought was, um, such a trip. Like I'm not necessarily upper upper class by any means, but when I read that line, I like a little part of me was offended by that concept of just thinking of the whole book. Yeah. Yeah, It's just a lot. Cause it places you and you can't, you can't help but place yourself Mm. while you're reading it. And and he does like, I, I do think, um, it's funny because I mean, um, what's what's the class at the end called for like the Bohemians, where it's like class X. Mm, mm-hmm. It's like there is, and he's like there is an artistic class to which like the general class rules don't like don't necessarily align. Right. And I remember, um, and, and like a, a number of friends who read that book too, who like all of us like getting to that chapter and being like, Phew, oh, okay, yeah, like, definitely, I, I'm I'm class X guys, it's okay, mm. you know, this weird relief valve <laughs> at sure. the end of it. But it really does, like, I mean, and he does, so, like, I love Fusel so much. Um, and I used to, uh, when I had a home, I've been, I've been subletting places um, while I look for somewhere to permanently live. Um, but when I did have a proper living situation, I would always have copies because I just bought a huge, because you can get them for a dollar. So I'd get like a huge pile of that and give those books. Like that would be if somebody came over to my house, like a little party favor, essentially. It was there was three books I did that with. It was Paul Fusel's class, um, Studs Turkle's working, which I highly recommend to oral history of people at their jobs, late seventies to mid eighties. Hmm. Um, and then there's a book about uh, oral history again by this guy named Mark Baker, who did these like real just airport kind of bestseller sort of mass market paperbacks. Uh, he had a book called Nam that was about the Vietnam war that was done oral history style. Um, that I think is one of the greater, one of the greater works of nonfiction, um, that you can get for a dollar on eight books <laughs> and give to people. Sure. Um, but, uh, but the class, yeah, I mean, class, class definitely aside from just it's, how astute it was, it was, I mean, I remember reading that and being like, this is, is like, I'm sure most, most people really into that book are like, this is the book I'd like to write. Like, this is such a, like, such a cogent and just like, you know, seemingly easy, just like seamless sort of, mm. you know, analysis of the world around him. Um, and just the, yeah, the underlying, the, the social infrastructure, if you will. Right. Of, of our culture. We focus so much on what goes on on the surface. He does such a good job of, um, of pointing out, um, yeah, pointing out the, the underlying motivations, just the, just what a factor, what a factor money and how we think about money is in yeah. absolutely every decision and kind of like affectation that we have. And what I, what I really loved about the book is it's not like, it'd be so easy to make that book mean yeah. and it doesn't feel that way it feels very loving sure. like in just yeah and um and especially you know you write a book called class you're breaking down the classes i don't know you know obviously in the classic sense of marxism is like that is approaching the world from a marxist mentality yeah. I, I don't know if i call paul fusel like i guess i you know i wouldn't call him like a marxist leninist but maybe he's definitely a marxist of some sort yeah. um Anyway, but it's, it's, there's something kind about it. And that was like what kind of blew me away too, was that you can 
like it's something I feel, especially on the internet, kind of gets lost. It's like you can you can you can be smart and honest and provide a service to the world without having to tear someone down or just like promote bad feelings or be nasty. That there is, you know. I remember was there's a line about I think journalism where it's like if it's if, if somebody's not angry it's not journalism and it's like I never mm. I, I was just like I don't think that's a great way to approach the world or if you're not making enemies it's not journalism I was yeah, like hey weird. it's like I, I don't know about that but then again I've also always had a problem with uh, the idea of speaking truth to power which is like that's that should be it's like as the as the fundamental goal of journalism um, where I think that's a great effect of journalism, I think the fundamental goal should just be speaking truth. Sure. Um, and you know, anyway, yeah. but that's me on, me on some soapbox now. No, you're fine. You mentioned class. <laughs> what I think is interesting too is, I mean, um, for those that don't know the listeners, I mean, you had a show called balls deep yeah. where you literally do essentially what you're, we were talking about there was, you go into these all sorts of different, I guess, I mean, balls deep sort of focused on, America for the most part, right? You didn't really. Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. Was, so, yeah. but you're traveling to all different types of areas with all different types of people, you know, for example, I mean, you mm-hmm. had, you know, you went to a place where they had like a tent church and then you worked on a tugboat yeah. and then you hung out with, um, you know, people that were bears, quote unquote. And then, um, gay, gay bears, gay not bears, like, exactly. Yeah. Not, not actual ursus, bears. Ursus, right. yeah, whatever. Ursus, ursus. But there's a whole like you just speak to different types of people, different categories and all these different things. What I was curious about is, did you choose those topics? Or was it something that was presented mm-hmm. to you or is it, you were just genuinely oh, no. curious yeah. about all that? I, I, I chose those topics. Yeah. It was like, and tugboats was a funny one because, um, I, well, first of all, I loved working on that tugboat. I, I think about that often. And especially cause now I'm back in Brooklyn. Well, I used to, I was, I lived in Catskill for a lot of years mm. and, um, which is about two hours North of New York. And I was right on the Hudson River. And so I'd see tugboats passing every day. Oh, wow. And, um, and, and so the idea, yeah, the, the, the groups, the different groups we, um, we filmed with, those, those were all, um, had just like a large list of those. And then my, um, the showrunner, his name was Dom Musaccio and team, uh, which, um, kind of like lead producer. I, I, never, I can never get people's titles right, but like, um, main producers sort of were uh, Annie Taylor and Cora Janelle mm. um, would, would go from that, from that little cruddy handwritten list where I was just like bears, <laughs> Muslims, whatever, and go find people who mm. are, um, who are good, you know, good representative examples of that. Um, but, um, but the, the reason tugboats ended up on that list was like in the middle of, yeah, in the middle of producing, it, I was just walking by the river on the way to work and, the tugboat went by and there's, uh, have you ever seen the Spike Lee movie 25th hour with Edward Norton in it? Oh, uh, I think Maybe. I have. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's, it's kind of one of his, yeah, it's not, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an odd one. Um, and like, I think I caught it on TV at some point, but there's a scene in it. So the whole deal is Edward Norton is about to have to go to jail for a long prison term. So he's spending one last night in New York, kind of got an after hours vibe to it, you know? Mm. So he goes out, sees all his friends, like, has his last night of freedom. And there's a moment when they've been out all night and the sun's coming up and they're walking along, I think it's the Harlem river. Um, and a tugboat passes by and they just stop. And it feels like almost like an improv moment where there's like, or an improvised moment. I just think I should never abbreviate that. Um, they're like, look at that. Wouldn't that be a good, like, wouldn't that be the life? And I'm like, yeah, just like get up, get on your boat every day simple life on the water all the time. And I had that exact moment walking, um, walking to work where I was just staring at a tugboat and thinking that exact thought. And then remembered, I was like, I was like, Oh yeah, that's like, I'm like I'm mentally reenacting a movie right now. Mm. Um, but then also just being like, be like, yeah, well, wait, I'm in a position. just like, Oh, I'm in a position to at least ask, um, to try to get on a tugboat. And it's like, and that is like, that that is what I want to do. That's genuine. Yes. And there was also there was an element um which uh like all the they're supposed to I don't know how much it came through, but the breakdown of all the different groups was supposed to coincide with uh there's supposed to be like kind of like a larger meeting to it. There's there's a reason I didn't because sometimes people would like pitch kind of weird niche, niche cultural things. So it'd be like they're like, oh there's these guys who are like, you know, 
they're practicing clown or they're like ventriloquists who teach, you know, who teach like Theravada Buddhism. And I was just like, I was like, that's very, I was like, that's really cool. Somebody should write an article about them. But I was like, I don't want to do like niche groups. I'd rather, you know, want things that have, like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, you know, I was, I was interested in kind of like the, whatever, the, uh, um, kind of the underlying themes of our culture, I guess, which is well, that's a pretentious way of putting it. But, um, no, no, no. I realized with tug, tugboats and it, it came from such a natural place. It come from, came from like, like basically like me being a three-year-old essentially mm-hmm. like at age 32 or whatever and being like tugboat. Cool. I'd like to work on this like boat, you know, yeah. just pointing at it. Um, but at the same time that that was like, I ended up reading this book called the box, which is about container shipping in the lead up to that episode. And, um, and it was, there was so much about, there's, you know, a good amount about kind of uh, labor, but there was so much about shipping, about freight, about our consumer culture, how we get the things we get that I'd never thought about that um, simply came from being on a boat and talking to the people who are near it, who, you know, who are just one little aspect of the process. Yeah. Um, but, um, and so I hope, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I was like, I feel like I lucked out with all those, all the topics and all the, the people I got to talk to. And that was because I had a really good team helped. Definitely. Like really did a really did a good job finding really good people. But I also, like, it also made me wonder, it was like, um, did I just like, did I just happen to luck out with the best people? Or is it like, if, like, I, I have this sense that like everybody is a lot, especially in America, that people are a lot smarter than they're giving credit for Hmm. that, um, like, and it overturned my own sense of, you know, the country I grew up in, um, that I feel like there's this, this weird kind of underspoken, uh, quest for self-improvement and specifically for education. Hmm. Um, like, I guess, you know, I guess you can call it like autodidactism, but, um, that, just as far as I've traveled in the country and seen is like, I like everybody I've met knows a, like a hell of a lot about something, whether that's, you know, whether it's something you don't give much credit to like sports, you know, like, or a very particular sport or a sport team. Um, or it's, you know, their line of work, which is the most common one where, you know, you go to a bar and meet somebody who can't, you know, couldn't tell you the name of a book written or couldn't tell you the name of a book, let's say, but can tell you absolutely everything you want to know about front end loaders and much more. Hmm. Um, it, uh, yeah, I have no clue where I'm going with this, but it, um, it, it made me speaking to everybody made me hopeful. Yeah. Speaking to more and more people always makes me kind of just, uh, gives me like, yeah, a more, cause I'm, I feel like I'm naturally a very pessimistic sort of, uh, nihilistic sure. even yeah. kind of type. And, uh, the best cure for that is to go out and talk, talk, yeah. talk to people. No, that's how I, I feel too. I mean, this show has yeah. given me the ability to talk to people and it kind of, I don't know, in a way, it's treats, a great tool, right? Sure. Yeah. And it's almost like therapeutic in a way to like, you know, talk. And I, you know, one of my, heroes that I look up to is Mark Maron. He would always talk about how he's more yeah. personal with his guests than he is with his own like family and stuff. And I was like, wow, there True. is something to be said about that, which I think is interesting yeah. too. When you talk about how you, uh, I don't know, you worded it like, Oh, you're lucky that these people were super cool. I think there's, yeah, that might be some part of it. But I think the other part is that you, you know, throughout your stories, whether it's on Paul's deep or, you know, when you did the show on vice for HBO, different things where you've mm-hmm. traveled and talked to, amazing people, including like Michelle Obama and stuff, you know, it's like those, um, I think the one thing that carries over in your way of reporting and journalism in a way, and I don't want to blow too much at like smoke up your ass or anything, but I think (laughs) one thing that is, you know, commendable and something that I really, really like is that, you know, I relate to you in the sense that like, I'm a smaller dude. I'm pretty sure I'm like a little bit shorter and smaller and wasn't this big old like guy. And what I really enjoyed is that you, I don't know, you almost embrace your flaws. You talk about like, you know, being uncomfortable with situations or like your acne or different things like that, which people would be like, why would you talk about that on TV? But it's like, it just comes right. off in this really genuine, authentic way that just comes off really, really cool. And I think in a way it makes the guests that you talk to just feel more comfortable and they're able to be more vulnerable with you. And as someone who wants to, I guess, you know, make 
somewhat of a career out of this as much as I can try. You know, I'm just curious as to how yeah. you, I guess, build that comfortability and how you, you know, have all these different types of people from all different types of backgrounds. And you have, you know, your own background and predispositions about who you are as a person. I guess, how do you find that common ground with literally everyone that you speak with and create that comfortability? Well, well, I think I'm, I, I am fortunate in that the, you know, kind of the most noticeable flaw about me, which is my height, uh, presents me to anybody I talk to, like almost across the board as not a, like the very first thing I assume anybody who sees me on the street, like they're in, like in on a, just a very animal psychology kind of level mm. is I'm not a threat. I'm not a threat to anybody. <laughs> like sure. I'm not, you know, I'm not a like I'm not a threat by a competition. I'm certainly not a physical threat. I'm not like, you know, um, I just come across like, I'm, I'm short, I'm a short man. And there's a whole psychology and politics to being short. I actually wrote a man, like an attempted manifesto that nobody would publish called up the shorts. That was about short men's rights. I think nobody could figure out if it was being serious or not, which I'm, I'm still not sure. Of. I'll but, read it. Um, I support you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's on, I, I have like a medium account that I use for, for most of my writing these days. Um, while, while I drag ass on creating like a website or whatever mm -hmm. I'm supposed to, you know, whatever proper thing people do, but they're writing on, but, um, but I think, um, like I, I, part of like the video part of my career was such a weird, ha like happenstance. Um, that I can kind of explain how it worked, but I, I, I hesitate to take credit for it because a lot of it, like a lot of it, I simply reacted to what was happening kind of like around me and a, you know, and whatever mistakes I made, like were, you know, just built towards better answers versus, you know, destroying me or ending my career or anything like that. And it, the, the, the starting point though, was that I never wanted to be on TV. Like, and I never wanted to be on video. And the very first time I was asked to do that, um, which is a crazy enough thing, which is mm. just like, that's, that doesn't happen very often. I felt like I was, you know, when I, when I talk about vice, I you know, often liken it to winning the lottery for a number of reasons. Mm. So it was just like, of all the places in the world that that company was not supposed to like when I started there in 2004, it was like, there was like, like that would have been the dumbest place on earth. I could have gone if I wanted a like a career in journalism, sure. a career on TV. I was like, it's just like that. That was not in the cards there. Um, it's, you know, it all, it all grew later in a really strange and amazing, a surprising way. Um, but with the video stuff too, I was asked to do that. Um, it, it felt almost like hazing because I, like, I, you know, I am, I am short. I am kind of unsightly. I, I, you know, I've got, I've got kind of a disposition made for, you know, not made for radio, made for like the written page mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went out on, on that first assignment, assuming that it wouldn't like that nobody would like it, which is an incredible, very liberating. <laughs> Do you remember that first so, story? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I remember all my stories. Um, I went to, uh, it was South Carolina. We were, it was before, so before Vice made TV shows for different mm. people and made, and had like all the YouTube stuff before YouTube. Even. No, it was like the first year of YouTube. Um, wow. We were making DVDs. The very first video stuff that I was involved with because there was one or two weird video projects before that. But the big, what led to the, the chronology was we started making videos, started making DVDs. Then we started making online videos under the name VBS and then came the television stuff. That's the real broad strokes version of Vice's video history, um, leaving out tons of parts. But uh, the whole idea with the DVDs was that we were just going to create like, I think that we're, we're going to try to put them out once a year, maybe once or twice a year. And it was supposed to be like a video version of the magazine. Mm. So there'd be, you know, eight or nine. And it really helped gel the... Um, kind of some, some aspects of the, you know, what kind of became the classic sort of vice format and that there were like 10, to, the first one was called the vice guide to travel and it exists. It became a DVD. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Um, yeah. And, um, it was, I want to say eight or nine stories. And because it was the travel issue, it was from around the world. 
Um, most of them are still up. And I was like, Gun Markets of Pakistan. Like that was from that yeah. DVD. I resonated with David. that because I was like, oh, that's, that's my neck. There you go. And that was pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and that was like, yeah, that was a real, that was the first time I'd seen, you know, aside from like conflict reporting, like a real, you know, kind of like any sort of glimpse into, I mean, it's a very specific uh, life there in Pakistan and it's very conflict oriented. Yeah, but, um, definitely. In any case, it was, it was a, it was a, uh, an eye opener. Um, Anyway, so we made that, and I like I was in it, I was working at Vice at the time. I was an editorial assistant on the magazine, and so I helped with the because we everybody you know there's only there's so few of us. Everybody helped with everything. There was no real like people's job titles didn't mean much of anything. Mm-hmm. If you were good at something, you did it. Like that was sort of sort of the deal. And so the editor who I mentioned, Jesse Pearson, who's, um, he's out in LA now. Uh, he put together this like really nice booklet that came with the DVD that was like, you know, kind of, there would be like interviews with the, with the hosts or subjects, kind of like behind the scenes sort of stuff, or just, Mm -hmm. it was a supplement, supplement to the, uh, to the DVD. And I helped with that, you know, just help transcribe shit and get, you know, get photos, the right resolution, things of that nature. But once we were wrapping up with that, like we were like, well, what, you know, the idea was, what's the next, what's the next DVD going to be? And it was going to, it's like, well, we did the, the guide to travel and like, we'll do the guide to sex, drugs and rock and roll. Mm. And like, so pitch stories, you know, um, which again, was always a, you know, it was like, rather than having some weird like silo where people could pitch things, pitching in those days was very much just like, Hey, come on with some ideas and email them to me. Like we're all, you know, just everybody would toss out stuff wasn't it wasn't about who you were it was about how good the idea was which was mm. you know a remarkable thing to see uh because it's not always the case and um and so i pitched an idea with the band the black lips who i just met and interviewed for the magazine who happened to be from very close to where i grew up in georgia mm. we became became sort of buddies over that and they had mentioned working, um, doing like, I think Habitat for Humanity stuff when they were in high school in the, like near Charleston on, in the sea islands, like those coastal islands with the Gullah people. And I'd forgotten until they mentioned it. I was like, oh my God, I forgot about the Gullah people. Do you know the Gullah people at all? No, I'm not aware. So they were the first community of or like the first well-known community of free black slaves or free, free black men and, um, and women in, uh, in America. Mm. And they lived in, they lived in the sea islands and it was, um, where exactly the, is that? It's so if you picture South Carolina, it's the, all the islands that make up the coast. Oh, okay. Okay. And so, yeah, that's the sea islands. And they're like, they're very marshy, very swampy. And the whole deal was that was bad land for um, agriculture, specifically for plantations, because it was so malarial. There were so many mosquitoes there. Wow. And um, yeah, and, and whites would just stay away because they would, they would succumb to it. And this, um, as, as a result, it became this, uh, the, the way this community took shape was that this was no man's land for white people. And that they had their own little settlement and they were able to preserve some of their, you know, I think it's like a pigeon of a few of their original languages from Africa, Mm. but they had, you know, religious customs and folk customs and stuff like that. They had their own discrete culture and they were left alone um, and allowed to, allowed to have that, you know, Um, they weren't screwed with or interfered. And that was, you know, well before the civil war, it was like, I'm trying to remember when the earliest records of it are. 18, some 1850, like 1810s, 1820s, that kind of thing. Um, but, and so they per like the, the community is still there. And there's also the Gichi people who is, I don't remember what the difference is, but it might just be two, like almost like two tribes. Hmm. But in any case, Gullah people, um, they, um, oh, uh, Clarence Thomas, really. Supreme Court Justice was is a Gullah person. He, he grew up there, oh, but wow. it's it's like it's like like you know many like like many like indigenous cultures and stuff like that. It's dying. It's a very like it's it's aging out. Kids don't learn the language as much as they used to. Kids leave town, like you know, like Clarence Thomas. Like you have prospects or a career. There's not much to do on the Sea Islands for money, and so you know, you go, you is go to like college a somewhere. You go thriving city over there. 
like they no, have buildings not. and um, stores there's and stuff like that. There's buildings and stuff like that, but no, it's like it's like a shitty suburb. Got basically. it. Okay. It's it's definitely yeah. It's a it's a dying community, dwindling. Let's call it a dwindling community mm-hmm. versus a dying community. Although the language is dying out, um, very few fluent speakers left. Um, uh, that's sad. But what was it is sad. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is what happens with uh, you know sure. cultures. You they assimilate. Yeah. Or, per, you know, persist or you persist with like a lot of a lot of support as a heritage thing, you know, versus naturally mm-hmm. having a bunch of natural speakers or there being a reason to, you know, know the language or anything like that. Um, it kind of becomes kept on life support by whoever ethnographers, anthropologists or something like that, which is, you know, is, is better than dying. Anyway, yeah. so they told me they were like, they were like, yeah, we spent a lot of time with the Gullah people. And I was like, oh my God, I haven't thought about the Gullah people in forever. And they were like, yeah. And they, they made this like, they were like, we, you know, like, there's like all the, all the kids there, them and their dads would make moonshine. And we'd, you know, we'd build these cabins for Habitat for Humanity and we'd finish up our day and just go get fucking wasted. Um, and so I mentioned that. I was like, it's like, this is a weird little, I was like, this, this fits in with drugs, you know? It was like this weird little like moonshine thing. People always do moonshine as like a white Appalachian deal, mm-hmm. West Virginia. Um, and I was like, and here's, here's, you know, I was like, the moon shines a chance to talk about the Gullah people who are fascinating, um, and may not be around for much longer. So, um, so I thought, and so I pitched this and I was like, you should send the black lips down to go see their old friends, talk about the Gullah people, talk about moonshine, learn how to make moonshine. And then ta-da, there's your piece. And they're like, cool, you go do it. You know, like you, you do it, you appear on camera. And I was just like, oh, that's not, that's, that wasn't the plan. Um, and so I went down and shot it with them, fully expecting all my stuff with just with, with a mind that like, I was like, I'm going to, you know, do my job, but I'm going to assume everything that involves me is going to be removed from this. Mm. And it's just going to, you know, just going to focus on, you know, it'll either be vaguely unhosted or, and, you know, I, I, I did my best to, like, coach, you know, the guys in the band to, to have enough information delivered and stuff like that, that, you know, it would be the Black Lips go to South Carolina and, you know, meet the Gullah people and get moonshine, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when I came back, they, like, like I, to this day, I don't know. They, like, like I passed my screen test, I guess. Mm. And the best, I, I mean, and, and I've kind of codified this sense in, in terms of... Uh, Especially with like, I, I find the best people on TV are the people who don't necessarily want to be on TV. Hmm. Maybe like, or just hosting. Or so maybe that's just like who I like to host. There's just there's a um, and I I started seeing it a lot more when I was like doing more stuff in America than you know abroad. That I feel like a lot of us spend our lives assuming we're going to be on. Spend a large part of our lives kind of assuming we're going to be on TV at some point. Or hmm. interesting. there's like this, like, it's just like a common fantasy. And I have it too. Like, I, like, I didn't want to be on TV, but I definitely like, you know, kind of like vaguely would picture that. And it's, yeah, there's like a mystique to it. Huh? There's a mystique and like, uh, it's cool. You know, it's, uh, right. Of course. Well, and it validates you. And it's like, right, who are yeah, you until totally. you're on TV? And, and you run into like, or I found that you run into people with a camera crew who behave in two entirely, you know, very distinct ways when there's a camera on them mm. and when there's not. And my preference is always for the, and there's a way, you know, some people, there's no way around it. And you're just like, that's they're you know, there's acting for the camera essentially, no matter what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some people who don't do it as badly, who are a little more natural, who just like accept that the camera's there and, you know, kind of behave as themselves. Um, but I think I like part of not having pursued a, you know, a broadcast journalism degree or, you know, training, um, put me in, you know, in a unique situation where I couldn't help but do it naturally because I didn't know how not to do it naturally. Mm. And once that was, and again, it was sort of like what I was telling you with the writing thing where it was like, I wouldn't have thought it was good. I had no, like, I don't want to look at me, <laughs> but, um, it's like hearing your voice on tape. It's just like, I'm just like, Oh, it's like, how can people listen to that all day? Sure. It's like, I mean, why am I talking? Um, but I, I got, you know, and from people who are, you know, not always super effusive with the positive feedback, 
I got very positive feedback, which was nice. And so I got, and so I left out essentially. And, um, and starting from that essential flaw, which was I'm completely untrained mm. and don't even really have an interest in doing the, this thing that I'm fortunate to do that people spend their whole lives trying to do, Just like, you know, off on a privilege. Um, that from there, the other ones kind of, uh, kind of came naturally. And, you know, I come from a background where it's like, yeah, you, you deprecate, you, you know, you take what's, you take what's uncomfortable and you, you know, just like hold it up and make light of it. And, uh, and I think it's appreciated. And I think there's like a, there's a sincerity in that. Yeah. Oh, and also it will, and the biggest one of all, and I'll spare you the lengthy story that, and, you know, it was like how I learned that, but it was, um, if you make yourself the butt of a joke, if you learn to be the butt of a joke, like there's, like there's a real, I don't know, you offer up, there's a sense of communion mm. that you can establish with people when you're not just there to make fun of them. Um, sure. And, and it took, and it took me, kind of learning this and you know it took me making fun of people and then getting caught like called out on it and feeling shitty about that and rightfully feeling shitty and 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 being like oh it was like this is and then noticing it in some of the things i watched on tv where it's like oh you know this person is nice to that person's face and then i went back and recorded a voiceover Mm. where they're just like they're making fun of their shoes it's just like not necessarily nasty, you know, a horrible thing or nasty. It was just like, it was like, oh, so unnecessary. It's like, yeah. like, why not, you know? And it's like, if you, um, it just, it, you know, it makes people angry about having been filmed. Um, there's this, like, whenever I work with people who had experience um, with like, especially with like, you know, a big network or something, having filmed them before, um, I always felt like I was like, man, it's like really, um, like, really trying to traverse some, some burnt, burnt ass bridges. Um, cause, uh, they, you know, it's, it's very common for people to run totally roughshod over, you know, just like, Oh, you're filming somebody. You're never going to see them again. Fuck it. You just present them however you want. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, how's that relate to flaws? Uh, <laughs> sorry. These, these trains of thought get extremely long and divergent. Um, no, it's all, it's all interesting. I guess you have talked to a a ton of people. You traveled around the world. What I'm curious as to think, and what you also mentioned is having a little bit more of a pessimistic or nihilistic view in the world. When you travel around, you, you know, experience these moments and you have this genuine curiosity and it seems like you have a really good time with these people. And it seems really cool because you build, you know, friendships with them, relationships in the same way that, you know, I mentioned Mark Marin before someone that I liked, he yeah. always talked about how he feels like he has a really cool connection with the guest or whatever. And then after he's like, yeah. I don't know if they like me or whatever, you know, maybe it was just <laughs> me feeling like I was super connected with it. Um, right. I was curious as to like, when you, I guess, get back to, you know, New York or where you're staying, do you reflect on all these like moments and these different people that you've met and how does that affect, I guess, your psyche and your, so, um, there was, there's not like a, 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 I want to say like maybe like an eight year period where I was just constantly on the road. It was mm. like, this just endless travel jag, get back from one place and, you know, I'd, I'd hop on a plane somewhere else and stuff would, it, it, I'd say stuff piled up, but it didn't feel that way. It felt like I was just blazing from place to place and person to person and story to story. And one thing I had fortunately beat into me in high school by a teacher I loved was to carry a notebook wherever I go. She's like, you should just always have a pen and paper Mm. handy. Um, and, and so I carry like, um, usually like, like, you know, like moleskins, like those little journal guys. Yeah. Um, try to, I just try to always have one of those in my pocket and those were always on the road, especially in like, um, kind of far flung locales where, you know, you can't just like sit and, check on your phone, mm. read, you know, read the news and stuff like that. It was always, um, it was always nice when during quiet moments to be able to just kind of like sit and write down things, reflect, you know, just collect, collect thoughts to, 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 to journal. I remember earlier when we were talking about journalism, that, um, one of the things, one of the things I love about like early journalism, stuff like that is that it was more like journaling, you know, it's like you get, 
you get a sense of um, people's daily lives with that. But anyway, so I've, mm. I've kept these. It's funny. I'm looking at them right now. I have, you know, this stack of old notebooks from the last 10 years from a whole bunch of different places, a whole bunch of different, you know, some of them are very, very much like journals and that they, you know, they follow a day, day by day kind of description of what was happening and who I was with and what they, you know, what, what all went on. Um, and then some of them are just kind of like odd, odd thoughts. Some of them are very like emo, just like mm. musings on the plane and crap like that. Um, a lot of lists of books I was supposed to, you know, I wanted to read at some point or another, mm -hmm. but, um, this all, so I got laid off last year mm. after this and, and right before that, like right after the second season of Balls Deep, um, I kind of like, and it's, you know, classic case, be careful what you wish for. Um, I wanted to like, like I met a girl I wanted to spend more time with. I wanted to like, I hadn't, I felt like I hadn't lived in the city for, you know, the previous five or six years because I'd just been going places, which is wonderful, but it just had gotten to wear down. And I just wanted to be able to spend a little time like in one spot and, um, you know, kind of like cultivating a personal life and a social life and things like that. And in, you know, in the forefront of my mind too, was kind of like, I was like, man, I was like, I've done all these stories and really quickly. And I feel like with a measure, you know, the best depth I could given how long I worked on them, but I, you know, I missed the opportunity to kind of like digest a lot of this stuff. And, you know, I write down this, I write down things longhand on the road in these journals, but like, I just have this weird stack of journals in my closet and I'd like to, you know, you know, as I, as this, this would have been, how old would I have been? 35. And I was just like, I'm 35, you know, I'd like to maybe, um, either just sort of, um, kind of like reflect yeah. on what I'd done for a little while and process it a little bit. And, um, and just maybe like, it was like, it was like, I'd like to, you know, be able to work on one thing for a little while. That was something I hadn't done in so long. Um, and, was, and just, I, I, I yearned for it, you know, just be like, to be able to really properly, you know, kind of like dig into a sub, some subject, whatever it was, um, and spend more than, you know, two weeks at a stretch trying to like just race through it. Mm. And, uh, and as a result, it was like, I ended up just like, you know, winding up kind of like in this weird, weird space of the company where like none of my stuff would get green lit. And then like, it just wasn't doing it. Like I went from having like my, like a, a crazy year in terms of output, which I think was 2016 was the last one. And it was, where it was like, I just made, they made two seasons of balls deep and a lot of other stuff. I was just doing, doing, doing to doing almost nothing. And mm. just like having none of my stuff published, having none of my stuff, having none of my ideas green lit. Um, what do you think was the reason it, for that? Was it, it has a lot of, there was like a, okay. yeah, yeah. political stuff. Um, there was a new, yeah, there's this kind of like new group of people who'd come into the company who'd taken over the news division. I got shifted. I mean, the, one of the biggest things, which is funny cause it's a, you know, look to the money whenever you want to explain anything mm. is the second year. So Balski was on our TV channel. So mm -hmm. Viceland. And after the first year of kind of like very, um, idealistic, uh, you know, don't worry about the ratings kind of like, you know, like just go make dream factory kind of stuff almost, you know, where it's just like, you know, there's a, not in a, you know, certainly not a great budget, but it's just sort of like, you want to do something. It makes sense. It's a good, good idea. Go do it. By the second year, it was like, you know, they're, that period had kind of come to a close and it was sort of like, well, we need to, you know, we need to assess, we need to assess what we're spending money on sure. and, you know, and what's working and what isn't as you know, it was a ne necessary reckoning. It was going to happen at some point, no matter what, but as a result of that, I got shifted from, because I'd been pay being paid out of the TV channel budget and that had covered all my work for the TV channel, but it also covered a lot of work for other sides of the company. I've been doing a lot of stuff with the vice HBO show um, kind of in the gaps between when I was shooting balls deep. Um, and that was essentially like, you know, being subsidized by the TV channel part of it. And my thinking was always that it's like, it's like, Oh, this is a, this is one company. This is vice. Like, 
it shouldn't matter where I end up or who I'm working, you know, working for as long as I'm doing work. Um, but, but it did. And so I got moved from one budget to another and I went from being able to do, you know, having a fucking dream job where I basically did anything I wanted to do, was able to say yes to any project I wanted to work totally across the board. Um, in all the different areas of the company to being completely limited to kind of like the news division in a very kind of like jealous and guarded way. Like, you know, I work for them, not for the others. Mm. And then on top of that, not getting, you know, just not having, not having ideas accepted, not, not having anything greenlit, arranging things and then just having them called off. Or like I was on my way out the door. It was very frustrating, very different kind of mentality. Sure. And it was a very, it felt a little more, like either a classic newsroom or what somebody who didn't actually run a classic newsroom might've run as a classic newsroom. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, there was a lot of lost opportunity there. I feel like, but as a result, I, you know, I, I, I did get what I wanted for. I was in one place and I was, you know, I had a lot of time to myself and I had a lot of time to, to write again. Like it was one of the things I'd wanted to do. Um, not that it was getting published. Uh, but, um, and all that shit caught up. And then, you know, two years in, I got laid off with a whole bunch of other people. Um, this, it would be February 2019 um, with, you know, very little warning. Sure. Um, what I think is interesting and, from an outside perspective of, um, I don't know, and I don't want to talk badly about anything or and, and please no correct me yeah. if I say anything negative, but... No. Um, when I was in high school, when I was younger, when I was reading the magazine, like my biggest dream in the world was to work for Vice magazine. And I was like, oh, dude, yeah. that's the fucking pinnacle, you know? And, uh, uh-huh. you know, it, it is super, I guess, disappointing because nowadays I essentially yeah. don't consider that an option at all because I've seen, I guess, you know, they started Viceland, but I'm pretty sure that whole like TV venture didn't necessarily plan out the way they wanted it to. And they keep winning Emmys and stuff on the show, but it just seems like it's sort of, getting smaller and smaller and you know it doesn't seem like for me you know as much as like I mean I'm gonna graduate in like a year or two or whatever but I don't know if it's still gonna be around by the time I get there you know so for me same it's a question yeah Yeah. which is years ago wasn't at all no not at all yeah because they're on the top you know and then on top of that is like you were essentially, you know, sort of the face of it. It was like you, Ben Anderson, weird, yeah. Isabel Young, and those people that had different types of stories, but they all had different ones. You know, it was like Isabel would go yeah. and do some cool thing undercover almost, and Ben would go, you know, put a bulletproof vest on and get shot at by the mm-hmm. Taliban and just these yeah. crazy stories. And then you would He'd tell, these, tell you what gun they're using while they're shooting at yeah, him. Yeah, like that. I mean, he's, he's intense. He's amazing. But... but yeah. um, I think that was like really cool and it became something that I was like, oh, it's amazing. But then I guess, you know, even from an outside perspective, not seeing it on an internal level, I saw, I was like, oh, dude, Vice is like slowly falling down a little bit, you know? Right. Yeah. And more than a little bit. I mean, that's your, I feel like you're, you're saying in a very polite fashion. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. that was, uh, and you could like, and it sucks because you could smell that coming and it's just like, and ultimately it's, yeah, it's like, there's, there's, you know, I'm, certainly certainly bitter about the manner in which i got laid off but like beyond that i'm just I'm sad that this thing that i loved being a part of right that i loved intrinsically and that was a very you know went through a number of different evolutions i mean i remember it's like it's funny one of the first things i remember reading about vice that wasn't vice was in 2003 and it was this old paper called the new york press talking about how like vice had sold out because they took there was some weird ad they had run in the magazine they were like well this is it it's like fucking vice is over mm-hmm. and then like i remember when we started the video stuff they were like oh this is it vice is over and then like tried to do that show on mtv and everybody was like vice is, over. This is done yeah. and that there was so like that that was just this recurrent theme that like you know i was like well they've blown it like it's done now and we'd pass through that and, you know, turn into something slightly different, but, you know, kind of generally, you know, for whatever we lost, we'd gain other things and improve, like, you yeah. know, the magazine. Oh, by the wayside, unfortunately, which was always, I mean, the magazine was my, my first love. And, um, and so it always made me sad when it wouldn't do, you know, when it wasn't, you know, the, what it, what it used to be, this, this incredible thing you wanted to read cover to cover. But at the same time, the video stuff became very, like, like very accomplished and like, um, and carved out its own space and was neat and stuff. And it's just like, I, you know, 
like it's 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 a little easy having you know been let go from there to be like well they're you know now they're screwed like now they're mm-hmm. going down a hill but it's like they are and like everybody talks about that and it's really disappointing and like yeah and it's just like it's like i don't know for me it's like watching a loved one die sure like it's you know, you're just like, when's it gonna, you know, you almost want it to end just because mm. it doesn't, you're just like, it's like, it needs to, you know, it's not getting better. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, um, did you ever feel during that process of, I don't know, I mean, you spent a decent amount of time there and that's just putting it lightly. You, sp- yeah. you I mean, graduated, I mean, you did an internship there and then right when you graduated from college, right you gra- started yeah, working there yeah. and then literally up until what last year. So, you yeah, know, that's that a my major job. part yeah. of your life. Yeah. Um, 15 years. Right. Yeah. So do you look back and I mean, you've had amazing experience, I'm assuming, you know, it's hard, it's hard to be like, oh, uh, you know, yeah. and you're still grateful for what you've had, all the different places you've been to on the people that you've met and the relationships oh, that you've dude, acquired, yeah. you know, um, there is but something commendable yeah. about that. Right. And I think for, oh, absolutely, you know, people like me that view the magazine, I mean, there's a certain sense of like, I liked it initially because Sarush is from Pakistan and I was like, oh, cool. That's a fellow Pakistani making it. And he, I liked the concept of them essentially creating a magazine out of what they like started working at a Haitian magazine and then created their own thing, like this whole backstory. So um, it's cool that they sort of made it and they paved the path for something that was, you know, oh, there's not an outlet for us. Let's create it kind of thing, which I thought was super cool. But then journalism sucks. Let's make the journalism we like. Exactly. Yeah. And I think right From now it is print than video. Yeah. Sure. And um, there was a period of time where journalism and news was, you know, sought after. And as someone who's in a journalism degree, you know, I hear left and right on a constant basis. It's like, why the fuck would you go into journalism, dude? Like when you have a president yeah. who's completely bashing journalism and talking shit on every organization, you have all these people that don't consider news credible at all. You right. know, it's like right. their news source isn't going to be, the Guardian or CNN or the Atlantic or whatever, they're going to go on Facebook and see what their friend Bob had to say about, you know, something happening. Yeah. And it's interesting. I was just, I mean, curious because your background isn't necessarily journalism, but you've very much been a journalist for the last 15 years, for the most part, uh, to an extent. What is your yeah. view on, I guess, the future of journalism and how you would... Oh, God, good question. Um I don't know. It's rough. I, I wonder, and I wonder if what we're going through now are the birth pangs of something greater mm. or if we're seeing a total collapse of, you know, just kind of discourse. Um, it bums me out to, I mean, and from a personal level, it bums me out how much I like, how much I rely on like Twitter and Instagram to sure. like yeah. for everything to keep in touch with people to find out what, you know, if things are going on to organize my social life mm. to try to promote professional things, you know? Um, I've, I've never had a Facebook account, um, which is not probably not smart on a practical level on my end. Um, but just the fact that everything's siloed there, that this, the internet, which, you know, when I was, which I was lucky to have a little bit of in my, um, while I was coming of age, like in my teenage years, I remember, I feel like I, you know, I, I really lucked out in terms of being born at a time where I could kind of you know, I got a sense for the analog world beforehand. Mm. And I know, you know, I, I know what it's like to have to go and try to like, you know, not be able to find a CD you want, like of a right. band you read about and you have no clue what they sound like. And you got to, but then, you know, you got to save 18 bucks, blah, mm. blah, blah, all that garbage uh, that like, you know, walk both ways in the snow to school crap that Gen X <laughs> folks tell us about now. Um, yeah. But, but then I also, you know, had, had, had a chance to use the internet in the early dial up days and was exposed to, all sorts of people and information and lines of thinking and stuff like that through that. And it's, it really depresses me to see the internet turned into three websites, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, three or four. Um, and especially it's just like, I think I said this at some point and I said it on like Twitter or something. So like there's your irony, but the fact that like we call three privately owned websites are our social media, like, which, you know, it's, it's funny. I remember a big, there was some professor who had a, like a real stick up his ass in my school, um, about kids using societal, which was like a big, like it was, you know, you'd, you'd throw that into an essay to kind of like make yourself seem, um, to kind yeah. of fluff up your point, but it, him just being like, and, and I remember I was probably a big offender of this too, where he's like, he's like, why do you guys keep writing societal? He's like, it's social. 
it's social. Social is what is the adjective form of society. Mm, um, interesting. And, uh, and, and I think about that when you talk about social media and I'm just like, just like, what a, I was like, Oh, what a bankrupt society would be, you know, we live in, if this is our social media, it's like, I don't, you know, it's like we, we treat Twitter as if it's this, as if it's his own medium. Like people speak about it that way sure. as if it's, you know, a new artistic form. Right. And all I can see when I look at Twitter is just like, I'm like, this could be the McDonald's message board. Like this is a corporation who has a website that we all use and we all, you know, we all decided to use it and therefore it has utility. Therefore it can, it can have a crazy impact where you can, you know, you can use it to get in touch with people from around the world. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, this is the consolidate, you know, it's like what media consolidation on a corporate level was like in the nineties. It's like, we're seeing in a just absolutely literal sense on the internet into this just tiny little cordoned off, you know, um, set of several websites that we use. What, um, and, and I don't see it improving sadly. I wish I miss the days when, you know, everybody would start their own, you know, when, when a problem was the fact that everybody had their own blog, you know, yeah. it was like, Oh Christ, everybody has their own blog. It's like, that's, that's, that's amazing. Everybody has their own little outlet. Everybody has their own little platform that they make that looks like whatever they want it to look like, or whatever they're capable of making it look like. Mm. Doesn't all look the same. Isn't all just like, you know, and isn't part of these like strange, you know, format restrictions where it's just like, it's like, oh, you know, oh, cool, a tweet, a tweet is, you know, something that is only 140 characters. And it's like, well, like who, like, what does that benefit us? We're not writing haikus on that thing. Like, right. It's like, that's just literally limiting thought yeah. and limiting expression and conditioning us to accept things that aren't wrong and that don't require reading comprehension. And you see that effect sure. outside of it. Um which sucks. And it just, it feels very, reg- and then, I mean, not, you know, and another thing, I'm all so fucked here. Um, but there's, it, you, Bob, it really, there's like the lower, like the lowercase F of Facebook, like, and I hate to it'd be like, that's the problem. But like, there's this <laughs> regressive infantile, strange language that I, that I fear I took part in part of in that we popularized a lot of like really stupid slang mm. in writing and vice. And it was because it was funny you know, it had its, it's, there was, there was a point to a lot of it, but then I look at like, I look, you know, at just the language that gets used, that's common parlance online. And I look at it along with like, alongside the names of these companies that start that are always like boofly, beetly boo. And I'm just like, Christ, when do we turn into this baby speaking or just like people, you know, respond to something that they agree with by just being like this, yeah, or like it me. You know, it's just like, why, why are we talking like infants? <laughs> it's right. like, Christ, totally. you know, why do we, why are we speaking with cartoon pictures? Like, yeah, like this man, isn't, totally. you know, it's, we're not, yeah. And it's like, and I feel like an old man, you know, old man yells at clouds there, which is, it's, which I just referenced a cartoon. There we go. But, <laughs> um, it does, it, it freaks me out and saddens me. I feel like we're, you know, we're losing, we're, we're, if we, you know, if we weren't an ADD society before, we're becoming one really rapidly. And what I liked, you know, and just it's that's an element of our culture that I loved. I loved, you know, our people's penchant for writing super long blog posts that, you know, you're right. like, Jesus, yeah. you crapped out 3,000 words last night. Fred Durst, I used to follow Fred, I, you know, Fred Durst, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful right? of, yeah, Limp Bizkit. Yeah. Um, he had a live journal that was public for like, not long. Let's call it like two or three weeks. Um, I think, you know, not on purpose necessarily. Well, I mean, he knew people were reading it. It was only for but, two weeks. Um, well, then it's, it's just like, he would, get com- uh, he would get comment. It, then like, you know, the internet discovered it as we, you know, I guess we still say that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was like, then, you know, it wasn't just because, you know, he'd have like, he'd write a post and then he, you know, it'd have get tons of fans because Fred Durst, but they would all be like Limp Bizkit fans. They'd be like, yo, Fred, like, thanks, man. Like, this, you know, I really relate to this, blah, blah, blah. Or just, you know, basic things where they're like, hey, man, I saw you in Sydney and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And that kind of stuff. But then it became, you know, it's like like Gawker found it, essentially. And I don't remember if this was before or after Gawker existed, but whatever the equivalent of Gawker was at that time found it. And there were sure. people making fun of him and shit like that. So he turned it private. But I remember, like, just loving it because it was, like, everybody else's fucking 
like, I mean, it was about his life. So it was about weird, different things. And it was written, you know, you, you know, it was written in the voice of the guy who wrote all the Limp Bizkit songs. You could definitely tell that <laughs> from his syntax and diction. Wow. But That's cool. it would be, you know, there'd be like quotidian posts about like, be like, oh man, I'm learning to cook. Here's this thing, blah, blah, blah. Or like, he, you know, I feel like the period, he, he might've been on the road for a little bit. I remember there was one, there's a picture of him standing in front of the Night Watch by Rembrandt. And that was the that was the whole post. It was just his head floating in the middle of this, you know, one of the most famous paintings in the world. And yeah. then the caption was "Me and the Rembrandt." <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then there was one I remember. You know, there's probably more than one, but there was one that was like 2 a.m. and he was like, "Man, just thinking about the, it was this really kind of morose, like like what's it all mean?" <laughs> kind of you know, like, like very teenage emo kind That's of post. So great. It was yeah. like you know, that everybody you know is the kind of thing everybody writes and either you know is like, "Oh, I should." publish this or not mm-hmm. um but it was like it was fun just doing that and um it was just it, yeah it was the, the promise of the internet to me was was always in that it was you know in its uh in its democratizing kind of effect on discourse and it feels like that got reversed and it feels like that got reversed because of because of capitalism you know mm. that's a bummer yeah. so so I don't see where it's going to go from there, whether it's going to be overturned or whether this is going to continue to a breaking point where the internet is all just Facebook, you know? Um, and that's the only way you can, I mean, I remember my ex was always on me about not being on Facebook because she was like, she's like, that's how people get jobs these days. And I was like, that's foul. I was like, wow, is that true? That I don't have Facebook. That's crazy. I didn't know that. No, well, okay. Well, I, I warn you that maybe, oh, maybe that's changed. I'm yeah. not sure. But, um, Regardless, it yeah, it's uh, that so that aspect of the media, which I also you know I don't know, and then the actual the true media, the news media, I think what people mean when they say the media. Um, I mean, Christ, it's like the the one thing that gives me a little bit of um, uh, makes me a little bit optimistic in a weird fashion, counterintuitive fashion, is that I don't think the media has gotten worse because I, I remember it always being this bad. Sure. Um, I don't think it's improved. And every so often you see something that's great. And every so often, you know, what, what, what's great about that is this summer I've been trying to make this show. And I, I went back to a lot of old media analysis kind of stuff. Cause there was, I did take, I always shit on J school, which, you know, caveat, like it's for some people, it's not for me. That's kind of the, just the deal. Um, what is it? journalism school oh, but okay, what okay. i what i did love because i had a bad bad time in reporting on and blah 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 and i've got all these you know mm-hmm. feelings and thoughts oh and i got slandered by fucking jelly abramson oh. and that nasty oh. book yeah. um anyway <laughs> uh but i did like i took all these media studies courses in nyu that i adored that taught me a lot about watching like you know how to watch the news how to you know what 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 things meant i got to do you know who neil postman is uh no I don't know. Okay. So he was like a, a cultural critic who, you know, Marshall McLuhan though. Yeah. Or, you know, the name at least. I do, um, yeah. yeah. So McLuhan was the huge dude, uh, the huge, you know, um, uh, critical thinker in terms of like, especially in America and Western media. And then Neil Postman was a protege of his and he was Canadian mm. and he wrote his, I think his most famous book is called amusing ourselves to death. He wrote a bunch of different books. I'm reading one called technopoly by him. Um, but he was, and he was very much like, you know, kind of a disciple of McLuhan's. He was like, you know, TV, like, especially like in terms of news and stuff like that, it's the, the form, the form of TV limits whatever content can be on it. There's a natural, you know, McLuhan's thing was the medium is the message. And that was, doesn't matter what mm. you try to sh- shove onto TV. The fact that it's TV means it will be, you know, TV will dictate the form, the form will dictate how the content's received and, in fact, what the content is. No matter what you try to do with it, you know, you have to work with the form. Like, you have to acknowledge how it works and how it's watched, you know, and, and how it's created mm. and those things. And th- those are more important than what the individual creators necessarily, you know, intend to put on it or how they write the thing or, you know, what the scene is. Sure. Um, I'm trying to remember where I was going with this, but I've been re- rereading a lot of that. So rereading Neil Postman, who was lucky that he came and spoke at one of my classes right before he died wow. um, in 2003. And it was like, I mean, he's, he's a legendary kind of figure. And that was really, it was a, an amazing experience that mm. had a major impact on me. Um, 
And then there's a French thinker, B.R. Bordeaux. Anyway, there's, uh, I've been reading a lot of old, like late 90s or mid 90s critical thinking about and critical theory about media, media analysis. Noam Chomsky's uh, was called, I think, Media Matters. Or was it? No. Media uh, policy. He has a he has a good book about media. Yeah. Um, Robert McChesney wrote uh, this amazing book whose name escapes me about media consolidation. Pierre Bordeaux, Jean Baudrillard, um, all these folks, and it's like um, like if you know if you if I didn't know for a fact the book was written in 1992, like it could have easily been written last year. It's like all the things they were saying then about the problems with the cable, the rise of cable news, the rise of the 24 hour news cycle, um, the problems with local news, the problems with, you know, kind of like the form, like reducing things to tiny, you know, tiny little sound bites and, um, two minute stories and like just the effect that that has on information in general and on society. Um, all that shit is still just completely germane. None of that stuff has changed. Mm, mm -hmm. Um, some of it's been accelerated by the internet. Some of it maybe is a little bit better because the internet, because there's more people doing things, but like in general, it's crazy. It's like the, um, and so to a degree, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like these, what scares me about the media has always scared me about the media. Um, and <laughs> it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So maybe, uh, maybe it's less drastic, you know, maybe it's, we're, we're less on a collision course for some horrific end, um, then, then I worry sometimes, but mm-hmm. if that is the case, then it's still just like, it's like, we have this consistent problem in our culture that needs solving. It sure. does not make yeah. us better people. Does not make our society better. Mm. Does not lead to, you know, lead to innovative change or something like that. And maybe since we're in a moment of such great rupture, mm-hmm. you know, it's one of those, it's, I'm rare. Like I, I spent, the last 20 years being resisting the urge to be hopeful for some sort of crazy revolution, Yeah, you know, not necessarily meaning kids throwing rocks on the street, although obviously I fantasize about that too. Sure. Um, but this is, it is, it is amazing to hit a moment of such, such a monumental crisis right now where the possibility that things could change, yeah. like just exists. Yeah. Sure. Where pessimism kind of falls by the way. I said, anyway, sorry. Long, <laughs> long no, time. you're good. I think that oh, no Chomsky really book was uh, manufacturing consent, right? Manufacturing consent. Yeah. That's exactly. Yep. Thank I you. I remember that when was I was younger, I about. went through a whole uh, Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn phase uh, where. Ah, uh, that's a good phase. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. I mean, his book on history was r- fundamental. Oh yeah, it's super good. Yeah. Um, what I think is interesting too is something that you mentioned at the beginning of our interview is how you didn't like the ethics of media. And how yeah. you felt like it was sort of derived from like the people at the station are like, oh, you need to make it this way. It doesn't necessarily make the best story or whatever. And I think that is a you know pretty clear and uh, concise representation of the media nowadays. You know, it does have sort of an yeah. agenda behind it and different things like that, which you know is you know true. Um, yeah, and t- regardless of whether it's a political agenda, there's always a corporate agenda. Sure, because yeah, there's yeah. a corporate structure, and they're always yeah. You can't lose advertisements. That yeah. is the thing. Yeah. And then I think what's interesting too is when you talk about um, being pessimistic about a revolution and all that stuff is I think it's mm. interesting that you have in a way talked to all sorts of different people across America, different demographics, different social classes, different things like that, you know, and all yeah. kinds of people from different wakes of life. And, um, you know, right now we're in a time where this year you know, with uh, COVID, obviously, but then, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and different things where people mm-hmm. are starting to rise up. Um, in a way, do you think, you know, as someone who has seen a lot of people in America and who has somewhat of a good idea of how the American people operate and what I think is cool, you said they're a lot more intelligent than you thought, you know, and these views that yeah. you may have initially had before you went into this field of like going and exploring this, I guess... What I would wonder is after, you know, 15 years of talking to so many different people from so many different backgrounds, you know, what is your view on the world? Does it make you more pessimistic or optimistic about the future that the world holds? Maybe not optimistic. It definitely makes me less pessimistic seeing the world. And I would travel to I would travel to shitty places. That's kind of like, that was, that was like my thing. It's like, if there was like, you know, I, I remember recently meeting somebody and they were telling me about Italy and I was like, Oh, I've never been to Italy. 
they were like, you've been to, then they're like, you've been to everywhere. And I was like, I've been to like everywhere bad. Yeah, <laughs> I've been totally. to all the armpits of the world. Um, and what struck me in all those places was always like, um, what always gave me a sense of pause and was, you know, really the thing that, you know, I took back with me home and that I think about and that sometimes wakes me up at night and stuff like that was that these awful things we see around the world on the news for five minutes at night, or mm. we see a post of on the internet or that I go for two days and, you know, walk around and expose myself to slightly and talk to people. It's like, these are people's lives. Like these are people's daily lives. Mm. And if you think about your daily life, it's this, you know, just roller coaster of ups, minor ups and downs, mm-hmm. you know, the joy of a simple, you know, going and getting your coffee in yeah. the morning, like slight, slight stress of being too late on email, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, there are these, you know, and those, and those are comfortable ones in, 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 in our comfortable lives here. And there's, you know, you see people in horrible situations who are living a similar life along similar emotional valences in drastically different circumstances. Mm. Um, and it was like, what, what, what I took away from all that was just how similar and like, I mean, it really gave me a sense for, it gave me a sense of humanity, like the, the actual idea of humanity, of collective Humanity of just like, like every, it, it, it always amazed me whenever I'd go, like, you know, the most foreign places I could think to go to, um, Amazon, you know, the Amazon jungle, the Kayapo, like you know, go hang out with the Kayapo, um, Indians in the Amazon, mm. like painted blue and discover that they were like, it was just like to recognize them and like, in a really like very, um, direct like kind of like you like it's like holy shit it's like you are the kayapo version of my friend darren mayner who i grew up with <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's totally. like there's, there's, it feels like you know it's like it's like oh my god there's only 300 people in the world and they're just repeated you know yeah several billion times in different iterations in different places um it definitely reduced the pessimism and, and you know what i don't think i've ever encountered is somebody i felt was directly evil I'm saying that, you know, this weird cadence because yeah. I'm trying to think right now as I say that out loud. But it's it's a it's an interesting thing to to kind of process, especially when people do bad things, especially like given what's happening in our government and shit right now. Sure. But on the ground, it's like everybody, it, and it's also it's a weird thing too where I um, it's there's I can't remember who said it, but something about falling in love with your subjects that just like, no matter how, you know, backwards or awful someone's doing something or how just how much you disagree with them in a political fashion, how retrograde their politics are, whether they're awful people or not. Um, I, I've never met somebody I didn't like, like, you know, just kind of like on an, on an essential human face to face level. Yeah. And to me that, you know, I don't know that to me, that gives me hope especially in this age of, you know, just kind of masked anonymity or slight anonymity online where, you know, people, you know, aren't necessarily anonymous, but behave that way and behave and strength, you know, just treat other people as these, you know, as not human, as it just, just this weird, just constant dehumanizing that we do in a daily fashion online. Um, that, uh, that, that can be, I don't know that can be solved. Yeah. I guess. Or that that'll go away. I don't know if it will. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. There's, it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird, yeah. The intersection between people's inhumanity online and via the media and how they learn things. And then everybody's intrinsic humanity. Like that, like they don't, yeah. The worst people I've met are still good people in some weird place in their heart who I like. Um, it's a hard thing to, hard thing to reconcile. Yeah. Definitely. And I think yeah. also like, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, for me personally, like I, mm-hmm. you know, suffer with, you know, forms of depression, and anxiety and different things like that. Mm-hmm. And I think I carry the same mantra as you, you know, it's like, I do believe that most people are genuinely just good, beautiful human beings. And I had a very similar experience in the sense that when I went back to Pakistan this past time, 
you know, I was born there and I came here when I was four, but I met a guy who, you know, was into literally everything I'm into. You know, he was like, oh, I watched, you know, Game of Thrones and, you know, I like this soccer team and it was literally the same soccer team that I like. And I was like, wow, dude, I'm literally staring at who I would be if I never came to America, you know? And uh, for me, that was a big experience because it showed and it shed light on the fact that like we are all, you know, a lot more similar then we are different. And I think that's the purpose and the importance of, you know, the work that you do and the journalism that I enjoy is that you show the similarities as opposed to highlighting the differences, which I think a lot of media right now is doing is just trying to divide people instead of like bringing us together and making it more relatable for what we do. Yeah. The, I, what, what always baffles me is, yeah, trying to figure out whether they know they're dividing people or not. Uh -huh, yeah. Cause it's like, um, yeah, because that is the the effect of it, and that part of me who kind of believes in the innate humanity of people has to think, be like, be like, no, so they, they, this has to be a must, you know, they have to think that they're doing something good for themselves, but maybe not. Who knows? Yeah, sure. Anyway, yeah, right on. Well, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We've already been talking yeah, for a long no, time. I, this, uh, yeah. uh, I guess one other thing I would wonder is just like, you know, with this year and everything that's happened and all that, like, what are your, what are your plans for the rest of the year? Do you have any like sort of like ideas of survive, survive? Yeah. <laughs> do you have like, um, um, do you want to continue to do stories? Do you want to start your own, like, you know, publication or anything? I mean, I'd love to, if I had, um, I need, I need part. I've, I've been looking for new partners in crime. I think the worst, you know, what, what destroyed me last year with the layoffs was, um, well, I mean, obviously I had a job for a long time and then I didn't and I had to scramble for cash. But I was also, it was like that, that place was my, you know, that place was my family. It was like, oh, the people I worked with are my close friends. They're the people I still talk to hmm. these days. And we've all kind of been, you know, I, I, I'm very nostalgic for, you know, earlier points in the Vice story where we all, you know, I got to work with alongside people who've become, you know, absolute close friends to me. And, um, and who I also, you know, like thought were some of the most, you know, clever and curious and, and innovative kind of people to work with. Like there was just it, it the folks, yeah, like they, you know, there was there was a there's a dream team quality to a lot of the stuff advice, which made, which was the whole reason when it's you know, it always bums me out when people are like, oh, must have been a bunch of trust fund kids since they didn't get paid much. I was like, no, I just like, I was like, dude, we live, we live cheap. It was like, we liked being there. Like it was, right. it's, a, it's a shame that people don't, you know, it's, it, it makes me sad that other people don't, haven't had that experience where it's like, it's like, yeah, I would sacrifice a little bit of comfort and it is a little bit of comfort to live, you know, to live at, you know, three times, like, was it? I was, gonna, I was just going to say, it, it always bums me out because it was like, it was like, there's literally people raising children in this city under the poverty line. Yeah. And like, you know, it's to me, it sounded like I wrote this somewhere where I was just like, like, Oh my, my word. How do they, you know, how do they afford their Dean and Deluca's like extra robustero on that salary every day? Yeah. It's just like, that's, it's, it's like such a snooty thing to complain about. And I'm getting away from the point again. Um, which was, what was the, <laughs> what was the question? Um, oh. these guys were my family. Oh, your plans, the, I guess. Year, yeah, yeah. This year, it's, it's to try to get the band back. We like what I, you know, what I, what I really miss was working with everybody, kind of on the same teams, under the same roof. And it's what happens, you know. You go, you know, the Beatles broke up and went on to their solo careers, and I feel like you know the Ringo of Vice. <laughs> that you know, now that the band is done, like what well, what do I do? It's like you know mm. all these people I worked with who were great filmmakers or great writers, or great reporters. Like they're going on to their their new things. And it's like I I just want to make you know the all star band and get everybody back under the you know same roof and like uh, so it's uh, the answers I'm not sure. I think you know honestly, we think we'll we'll all see how this year ends. Sure. Like, so, first, first and foremost, surviving. Yeah, surviving. Yeah. Trying to make a little bit of money. I'm trying to make a show um, for this company, Topic. Um, and yeah. I have not. I have, I have done a remarkably weird job of that. That has been. They have been extraordinarily patient with my attempts at making it. Has been a very strange, bizarre journey that I hope all kind of like makes it 
into the final product and which I do hope I get done soon and air soon. Um, and then I've been trying to do a lot more writing, which, uh, which I've been posting. And uh, I think that's, yeah, those are, that's the, those are the plans for the moment. Yeah. Just kind of reestablish, uh, just try to, I, I have a backlog of stuff. Like, and like when you were asking, it was like, you, you know, how do I, I know you meant it in a way where you're kind of like, how do you sit with all these things that you've seen and all these people you've done? And, and my answer to that, by the way, too, which I'd been warned about. And, uh, uh, and of course, despite being warned, never took seriously is that like, if you don't, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, I didn't deal with them. So they you know, ended up dealing with me. I ended up having like just, you know, waves of strange, you know, dealing with a lot of like intense situations five, six years later mm. as kind of strange traumas and weird night terrors and things like that. The intensities of life, like, you know, they don't resolve themselves. So in, in the course of digesting those and going back through old journals and stuff like that and reliving some, you know, you know, there were great times and then there were horrifying times, sure. uh, as, as happens when you're, you know, places where people shoot at each other and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, I don't know, hopefully I put like, uh, I'm hoping I'll, I'll wrap up, I'll wrap up the, you know, the first chapter, yeah. the vice chapter, the first however many chapters I got, I had a lucky break. You know what I was thinking of earlier? It's funny. It's like, I always, there's these two thoughts I have that I never put together until just now. And one is I always treat, um, anybody asks, like, you know, just about Matt, like what, what I think overall about vice. I'm always just like, I've won the lottery. Mm. Like I took a, I took a summer internship and then 15 years later, like I, you know, or 13 years later, like I was traveling the world. I was on TV. Like I was like, I'd met the love of my life. Like, you know, I was living comfortably. Yeah. Um, I was like, that's crazy. But you know what, what, what is also true? Every, like almost, I think it's nearly 100% of people who've won the lottery have declared bankruptcy yeah. <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and and so, yeah, I never, and, as as said, two thoughts I'd, I'd toss out from time to time, but I'd never quite put together. So I think I'm in the I'm in the bankrupt period of that, but hopefully that will result in um uh, character. Beats me. Sure. I don't know if you were to. I don't know. It's always weird asking for advice or whatever. But if for you would advice, have, yeah. yeah, I always have. And since I've described to you exactly how I kind of fell into my work, I always yeah, I always couch any advice I give in that like my life is not a model. I mm. think. That, mm-hmm. that I could follow a second time, you know, I got, sure. like, I was a lottery winner. I was, I was just, I was in a very, like, I was in exactly the right place at the right time. And, um, yeah. And everything's kind of followed suit. And so, yeah, the advice, the advice I give necessarily kind of follows from that, which is just like, you know, kind of appreciating it's, it's such, it's, it's, you know, it's Hallmark card advice. It's like appreciate what you got and just, you know, kind of like, you know, ride the wave and we're into like, just expect, well, one, one piece of advice I actually do. I would give, um, uh, is get used to plans not working out. Mm-hmm. Um, because they never like, especially like in the, in video, like, especially if you're doing broadcast and you're doing video, um, I've never had a shoot work out the way it was supposed to. And usually like, I've, you know, whatever, like basic plans will fall through like, like to a ridiculous extent. And the one thing that was drilled in my head from that very first shoot one thing that was said to me as I was leaving the office, which I think was a joke, but I could never tell was bring back a story or you're fired. Mm. And then everybody laughed and I was just like, Oh fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's a, Jeez. I was like, I don't know what, I was like, I already didn't know what I'm doing. I was like, and now I feel like shit. Wow. Yeah. Um, but what it led was because I got to like, I went to South Carolina, supposed to hang out with these fellow people and get the black lips to get them to make moonshine and stuff like that. None of that stuff worked. There was mm. problems from the get go. We showed up and it's like, there's a classic, uh, in, you know, the Pr- Prussian military theorist, uh, what's his face? Klaus von Clausewitz hmm. is like, no, no plans survive contact with the enemy for first contact with the enemy. Huh. And so he's talking about war, which right. why we have to couch everything in our lives in the language war is its own can of worms. Huh. But in general, I was like, like from that get go, it was like nothing on that shoot worked. And what I can, but I figured out how to come back with something. Right. Like, and, um, there's always a story. There's always, you know, and, and it's very, and it's like, and to an extent that that's like the, that when things, 
when things fail, um, not to be like, you know, oh, which is, sounds like it's like, oh, the Chinese word for crisis is actually opportunity or whatever. <laughs> um, but it's like when they, you know, when my expectations have, you know, completely not worked out, like usually the story I ended up finding was better. Like, you know, um, and, uh, and it's led me to like, you can't just not plan things. Nobody likes that. No one will give you money. But um, if you, you know, if you learn to adapt and to not be stressed out by the fact that you have to adapt, and I think that's maybe the most important thing of all is figuring out how not to be stressed out mm. about shit. Um, especially by like, just like basic work. I think we're, a lot of us are conditioned to like sit at our desk and type things, you know, while sighing. Yeah. Like, oh man, look, look how hard I'm working. Um, if you can break that mindset, and then especially like out in the field, if you can be, you know, like chill willy, like everything, everything will eventually work out in some way or another, yeah. you know, and usually a lot better. So just don't like, yeah, don't not make plans, but expect your plans to fail and just, and th- which doesn't mean don't ma- make backup plans. It means just figure, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to fail. Yeah. Like, or, or the plans are going to have to fail. You don't have to fail. That's, I'm sorry. So that's the advice. <laughs> it's, I, I, yeah. I, I, as you can tell, I'm really formulating this as we're talking. This is not from some. <laughs> no, 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 no. I totally understand what you're saying. Well, I think it, it is well, a sort well, of a out, yeah. no expectations kind of thing, or at least no. Uh, Just be ready for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, and yeah. Yeah. Just be adaptable. Yeah. I guess so. That's, that's my best advice. Awesome. Learn, learn how to actually, yeah. Uh, learn how not to rely on plans. Right. Cool, man. Well, uh, I guess as we wrap up, um, yeah. do you have like any links or anything where people can, oh. you know, check out your work and all that good stuff? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Actually, I, I really need to make a website. Um, I guess the best place to look is my, so I get like, all my writing right now. And I've been trying to, cause it's, my, my writing is sort of everywhere. I never really consolidated it. Mm. I have this medium account and it's just my name. I think it's just Thomas Morton. Okay. Let me see. Actually, it, I think if you Google that, if you Google medium and Thomas Morton, it shows up and I've been trying to like archive a lot of old writing on there and I've been writing some new stuff. I wrote this thing about Heart Island recently. Yeah. It's just uh, medium.com slash yeah. Medium.com slash at Thomas dot Morton. Thomas Morton. Okay, that's me. Yeah. Okay. That right? so that's, yeah, that's the best yeah. place for my writing. And then my Instagram, which is kind of how I keep in touch with the world, sadly, is Baby Balls, which is my old nickname mm-hmm. from work. And then my Twitter is Baby Balls sixty nine. Awesome. You're welcome, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, man. Well, I mean, once again, thank you so much. It's uh, well, thank you. It was an absolute it was privilege. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Double Life. If you want to catch more of Thomas's work, you can follow him on Instagram at Baby Balls, or you can go to YouTube and just look at all the different videos and documentaries he's done over the years. You can follow us at The Double Life Pod, and we'll see you next week. Appreciate your support. Make sure to subscribe. Adios.